Good morning. Welcome to today's presentation on the importance of an ERISA GAAP assessment for health and welfare plans. My name is Deborah Hyde, and I am ERISA counsel here at Felice Insurance. Today's presentation will address three major components. Components of an ERISA GAAP assessment. So first, we'll lay the groundwork by covering the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. So we'll examine what exactly constitutes an ERISA regulated plan. We'll cover the requirements imposed under ERISA, and then we'll touch on compliance enforcement. We'll then turn our attention to the GAAP assessment itself, and we'll look at how and when to conduct a health and welfare plan GAAP assessment, as well as the benefits you can really uh, get from conducting a GAAP assessment on a somewhat regular basis. And then throughout the presentation, I will point out and address some common compliance weaknesses that I've observed. If you have any questions at any time during the presentation this morning, please feel free to use the question and answer feature located at the bottom of your screen. And I will be sure to leave uh, several minutes at the end of our discussion this morning to get through as many of those as possible. There's also a link to a PDF handout at the bottom of your screen. Um, this isn't necessary to have with you or have in front of you to go along with our discussion this morning, but it does go into quite a bit more detail than we'll be able to get into. So hopefully it will uh, serve to be a useful guide for you going forward. So let's start uh, with perhaps the most basic, yet really the most essential question, which is what is ERISA and what is an ERISA regulated plan? Uh, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act is federal law that sets minimum standards for employer-sponsored group health plans. And I apologize for that. I think I'm skipping over a slide somewhere. Um, but bear with me, please. Um, so ERISA is federal law that sets the minimum standards for employer-sponsored group health plans. Some employers are somewhat surprised to find out that the Retirement Income Security Act actually regulates their group health plans, but it certainly does. It applies to your group health plan in the same manner uh, as it applies to your group retirement plan. ERISA regulates fully insured, self-insured, and partially funded plans of all sizes. There is no plan too large or too small to fall under ERISA regulation. There are, however, two main categories of plans that are exempt from ERISA regulation, and those are state and local government-sponsored plans and church plans. So there are four essential elements of every ERISA plan, including your retirement plan, and those are a written plan document pursuant to which uh, the plan is to be administered, a separate fund, an account, or a carrier in the case of an insured health plan to retain premium payments, a record keeping system that goes back at least six years, and communication and disclosure materials for employees and for participants. So for our purposes this morning, uh, one of the most significant aspects of ERISA regulation is this concept of plan fiduciaries. And plan fiduciaries are those who exercise discretion in the management or administration of the plan. So employer sponsors, administrators, trustees, and claims administrators are always fiduciaries when acting in this capacity, and that's because they have decision-making authority over the plan. Fiduciary status under ERISA is incredibly important because fiduciaries are charged with various duties under the law, and these are actually recognized widely by courts as being the highest obligation known to law, so they are taken very seriously. And these duties include the duty to act in the sole interest of participants with the exclusive purpose of providing benefits. This is also known as the exclusive purpose rule. The duty to act prudently, to follow plan documents. The duty to hold plan assets in trust, or as we mentioned in the case of a fully insured plan, to remit those payments directly to the carrier. And then finally, to pay only reasonable expenses. ERISA does interact with other federal regulatory provisions. 
So when we think about ERISA compliance, it really encompasses compliance with these other federal laws as well. And those include the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, also known as COBRA, and that of course applies to all employers that have at least 20 employees. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which of course is on everyone's radar right now, and then the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Also to keep in mind for fully insured plans is state insurance law. So ERISA operates separate and apart from state insurance law, and that means that the two will never conflict and they really operate in tandem with one another, but it is uh, another layer of compliance that fully insured health plans need to keep an eye out for. Okay, so with these various duties and legal requirements in mind, how exactly is ERISA compliance enforced? So the United States Department of Labor, or the DOL, is primarily responsible for enforcing uh, ERISA compliance. And more specifically, that falls upon the Employee Benefits Security Administration, or EBSA. So EBSA is the division of the Department of Labor that is tasked with enforcing group health plan compliance with ERISA and all of those related laws that we just touched on. EBSA, conduct, EBSA conducts investigations and audits, and they also hear and follow up on complaints from plan participants and employees. So it's not just uh, random audits or uh, pre-selected audits and investigations. EBSA also uh, is a division of the DOL where employees or participants can directly submit complaints or issues that they're having, and then EBSA is obligated to follow up on those complaints to the extent necessary. EBSA has the authority to assess both civil and criminal penalties, and they do assess pretty hefty fines for any compliance violations that they uncover. And then finally, it's really important to keep in mind that the DOL has a joint initiative program with the Internal Revenue Service, which means that the DOL and the IRS really cooperate with one another when it comes to the investigation or audit of a group health plan. So if the IRS initiates that investigation and uncovers some information that might be important to the DOL, they will share that information and hand that over to the DOL and vice versa. So it's really both of those federal agencies that are tasked with enforcement. Okay, so let's turn our attention now to the gap assessment itself. And a gap assessment entails quite a bit, and it covers really a lot of ground. So this morning, I just want to cover the basics so that you'll be able to approach a gap assessment with confidence and be able to do so efficiently. And really, the uh, primary objective is just to allow you as the plan sponsor or administrator to take control over your group health plan's compliance. So a gap assessment is really just a thorough examination of a plan to ensure operational and administrative compliance. It also allows you to identify any compliance gaps or holes and to address those proactively rather than waiting for an agency or some other issue to uh, uncover those. Is a gap assessment applicable or is it right for your group health plan? So we just discussed how ERISA applies to all group health plans with the exception of those two categories. So um, regardless of the size or the funding scheme of your plan, an ERISA gap assessment will be beneficial and really quite necessary to evaluate your plan's uh, compliance status. And then of course, as plan sponsor, uh, you have an obligation to ensure your plan's compliance. So you will be on the hook for ERISA compliance regardless of who ultimately is responsible for that uh, potential gap or hole, it's ultimately going to fall back on you as the plan sponsor. So I've broken down the gap assessment into five key areas of focus that can be approached either at different intervals um, or they can be approached all at one time. It's really just about what works best for you and for your plan. So step one is to review plan documentation. And this requires you to track down all of these plan documents to ensure that they're accurate, that they reflect uh, current information, and of course to make any necessary updates to those documents. 
So the first one that you'll want to look for is actually the plan document itself. And you need this, uh, this formal plan document for your health and welfare plan, but then you also need to be sure that you have a plan document in place for the flex plan or pop plan or any other um, HRA that you might have in place. So you need to have those uh, formal plan documents. You need to be sure that you have a summary plan description in place as well as any necessary summary of material modification to reflect any changes or updates to that summary plan description. And the summary plan description, or the SPD, is actually one area of uh, common compliance weakness. And that's because the SPD, um, it's a required document under ERISA, and it's really a summary of the benefits offered through your health and welfare plan, and it outlines sort of the administrative and operational procedures of the plan. So it includes information such as eligibility definitions, funding schemes, any required contributions to participate in the plan. It also must contain some legally prescribed language and notices, for example, the statement of ERISA rights. So the SPD is not provided by an insurance carrier. Uh, the carrier will often provide you with something like an evidence of coverage or a certificate of coverage, which does contain some necessary information, uh, but it doesn't rise to the level of an SPD. So you need to make sure that you have a summary plan description document in place and made available to your participants. Uh, as far as plan documents go, you'll also want to be sure that you have the summary of benefit coverage uh, made available, and of course that's a newer requirement through the Affordable Care Act. And then the summary annual report, or the SAR. So this is required of plans that have to file an annual 5500 report. So if you're not filing or you're not required to file the annual 5500 report, you won't be, uh, you won't be tracking down a summary annual report. So that only applies to those who filed the 5500. The second step is to verify your annual disclosures and filings. So at this point, you want to go back at least four or five years and kind of double check and audit yourself to make sure that all of the necessary uh, disclosures and filings have been made in a timely fashion and also that the information that you included and the data you included is accurate. So first off, we have the W-2 reporting under Section 6051 of the Affordable Care Act. And this is a new requirement. It's been in place for the last couple of years. It applies only to employers that filed 250 or more forms W-2 in the prior year. So at this point in time, it's not applicable to all employers. It's just those who filed 250 or more forms in the prior year. Um, if that's you, then you're required to include on the employee's W-2 the uh, aggregate cost or value of the health benefits that were provided to that employee that year. Also under the ACA, you have reporting under Section 6055 and 6056. So this is a brand new requirement that hasn't even come due yet. The first time it'll be due is going to be in the first quarter of 2016. It does not apply to all employers. Uh, instead, this is really just for employers uh, who have generally 50 or more full-time employees, and then for those employers who have uh, a self-funded medical plan. So for these employers, you are going to have to start complying with the reporting under these sections, um, and that requires submission of documents to the IRS, as well as some employee statements. So of course, right now, if you were to do an assessment, you wouldn't be checking to make sure that you had those reports filed, uh, but going forward, that will be part of your checklist. The CMS disclosure, so this is the annual disclosure that you have to make to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and this comes due within 60 days of the start of the plan year, so it comes up pretty quickly. The good news is that the CMS disclosure is, at least in my opinion, uh, the easiest or the simplest disclosure to make. So you simply go on to CMS website and you spend about 10 minutes answering some questions about your plan, about the uh, prescription coverage that you offer under your plan, and whether or not it's creditable or non-creditable coverage, and that's about it. So it's, it's done online, and it takes only a matter of minutes to do that. 
And then finally, the annual form 5500 report. So this one, as we just touched on, it's only required of employers who have um, 100 or more active participants in their plan. It is due within seven months following the close of the plan year. Uh, so for January uh, first plans, you have until the end of July to get those in. It is important to go back um, and to go through these reports. They're pretty easy to access uh, through the DOL's website. And you want to make sure that for all of those years that you were required to file, that you got those in and that, you've, uh, that you submitted the appropriate data. Uh, the IRS and the DOL do allow for corrected and late filings through the voluntary correction program. So if you find a hole, if you find that you're missing a year um, or that you know, something was submitted erroneously, it's really important that you take that proactive step to make the correction and not wait until uh, it's perhaps covered or uncovered by the IRS or the DOL. The third step is to review participant notices and communication materials. <clears throat> and this, or this really includes all of the federally required notices. So that covers things like the uh, model exchange notice that you have to provide to all employees, not just your participants. This is one of the newer notices required under the Affordable Care Act. It's been in place for a couple of years now, so you want to make sure that you're distributing this notice to all of your employees, not just to your participants. The notice of HIPAA privacy practices, as well as the notice of special enrollment rights, the initial COBRA notice or the COBRA general notice that you have to provide when you have uh, an enrollee on your health plan. The Medicare Part D creditable or non-creditable coverage notice. The CHIP notice, and this is not applicable if you have employees only located in California, but if you have them located outside of the state, you need to be sure you're providing the CHIP notice. The Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act notice, and finally, the Newborns and Mothers Health Protection Act notices. So there's a lot here that has to be communicated and provided to your employees or your participants in one way or another. So you want to make sure that you're getting all of these out uh, in a timely fashion, but also that they're reflecting current information. So if you uh, uncover outdated information on some of these documents, even if it's as small as a phone number or an email address, you need to be sure that you get those updated and promptly distributed to everyone who needs to get one. And then finally, uh, you need to examine your distribution method. And that's going to either be you're providing these, cop uh, these materials in hard copy form to all of the participants or the more preferred method of electronic distribution. But the distribution, especially when it comes to electronic distribution, is a common area of compliance weakness. And this is because employers are really moving more towards electronic distribution, and that's, that's understandable. We're trying to get to a paperless system as much as possible. But you need to really be careful if you're utilizing electronic dis distribution. For your employees with work-related computer access, so they uh, access a computer as a regular part of their job duties, electronic distribution is perfectly okay. So you can go ahead and distribute all of these notices and documents to these employees electronically. However, for any employee, even if it's just one employee, who does not have daily access uh, to a computer as part of their job duties, you must obtain affirmative consent from that employee before you utilize electronic distribution. Um, and so that requires you to get written consent from them prior to distributing these electronically. Now, an employee has every right to withhold that consent. Um, and if they do withhold that consent, you're obligated to provide that employee with hard copies of every single required notice and document. So yes, that's a lot of paper that you may end up providing and going through, but as plan sponsor and administrator, you are obligated to ensure that every participant on your plan actually receives these required notices and documents. So be sure that, you, that when you're going over these notices and communications in step three, that your distribution method is sound. Step four is to examine administrative procedures. 
So this one casts a pretty wide net, but we can actually narrow it down to a few specific aspects of administration that you should uh, hone in on. And the first is eligibility determination. So this is particularly important uh, for employers who have a large population of variable hour employees or employees who tend to shift between full-time and part-time status pretty frequently. You need to be sure that your definition of an eligible employee is clearly stated and clearly communicated, and then that it's consistently applied for every single employee. You don't want to waver back and forth or change how you determine uh, eligibility based on one employee versus another. Another area to really pay attention to when it comes to eligibility is your definition of an eligible family member or dependent. So this happens to be another area of compliance weakness for a lot of plans, and that's because you, you, your plan or your policy sets forth who an eligible dependent is, um, but when it comes to who you actually allow to enroll and participate on your plan as a dependent, it might not match up. This also comes up pretty frequently when you have special exceptions for a particular employee for whatever reason. Um, you know, maybe your plan only allows registered domestic partners to participate, but you have an employee who has an unregistered domestic partner, and you say, okay, you know what, that's fine, I'll let you enroll, or maybe they're enrolling a, a non-dependent niece or nephew on the plan. You really can't be making those special exceptions. You need to um, administer that definition consistently. You should also take a look at your enrollment and terminations processes. So uh, open enrollment and new hires. How are you communicating your benefits information at these points in time? And then how are you actually handling um, open enrollment and new hire enrollment? Are you sticking to deadlines that you set or are you allowing uh, late enrollees to come onto your plan uh, and so forth? Take a look also at your mid-year election changes in qualifying events procedures. So here's another common compliance weakness. And this is because when you have a participant who enrolls either at, at open enrollment or as a new hire, uh, that individual is not allowed to make mid-year changes to their elections absent a qualifying event. So what you don't want is you don't want to have this revolving door policy with your health plan where you have people jumping on and off throughout the year or you have them switching their elections throughout the year. You need to be sure that you clearly define and communicate what constitutes a qualifying event and that you uh, don't allow these mid-year changes unless a qualifying event actually occurs. And then finally, as part of this, you'll want to uh, take a look at your COBRA elections uh, procedures. So you want to be sure that when you have a termination, um, that that termination is timely communicated to the carriers, if any, and that the COBRA election materials are promptly sent out if that individual is, in fact, eligible for continuation coverage under your plan. Take a look also at HIPAA privacy and security rules that you follow when it comes to your plan's administration. Uh, you want to be sure that you have policies and procedures in place for how you handle protected health information of your participants and employees, and that you have steps in place to prevent the unauthorized disclosure of that PHI. And finally, employee contributions. So if you require that employees contribute to participate in the plan, you need to be sure that those contributions are either maintained in a separate account or that you turn those over to the insurance carrier promptly. Uh, you do not want to allow those contributions to commingle with the general funds of the business. Um, the contributions, in fact, constitute plan assets, and they must be kept separate from the general assets of your business. So the fifth and final step is to check in on third-party administrators and vendors. And really what you're doing here is you're simply exercising some oversight. So uh, as a plan sponsor or administrator, it's perfectly acceptable and actually uh, wise to turn over certain aspects of the plan's administration to a third party. What you don't want to do, though, is you don't want to just kind of hand over the reins and then turn your back to it. You want to exercise oversight and stay involved because, as we talked about earlier, 
as the plan sponsor, you will ultimately be responsible for any uh, issues of noncompliance that occur as a result of a failure by one of these administrators or vendors. So uh, first, you want to take a look uh, at your insurance carriers if you have a fully insured plan. <clears throat> You'll want to reconcile the monthly billing statements that you get. And this is really for two purposes. So the first is you'll be able to audit and make sure that everyone who is participating and everyone who elected to participate is, in fact, properly uh, enrolled in the coverage that they elected. And then also you'll be able to uh, make sure that the amounts you're being billed are accurate and that you're not paying more than what you agreed to or what you thought you were paying. <clears throat> Also take a look at the terms of the insurance policy uh, compared to the terms of the plan. So you don't want to have conflicting terms set out in your insurance policy versus those that you set out in your plan documents and communication materials. So for example, if your policy defines eligibility in one way, you want to make sure that your documents and your communication materials uh, reflect that and they don't conflict. <clears throat> And then you'll also want to be sure that the claims administration process that oftentimes is taken over by the carrier is operating smoothly. So you do need to check in on that every now and then and make sure that claims are being administered promptly and that any appeals uh, are going through the necessary channels. If you have an administrator taking over COBRA for you, which is a great idea, I highly recommend that, um, be sure to check in on them and exercise some oversight there. Be sure that the administrator is distributing uh, the initial COBRA notice to any new enrollees on your plan, and be sure that they are getting out termination, or I'm sorry, election notices to terminated participants as well. So when you have an employee termination or you have an employee who's no longer eligible to participate, uh, so they fall off of your group health plan, be sure that that COBRA administrator is communicating with those individuals by sending the election notice and by uh, administering that process for you. If you have a flex plan or HRA administer, administrator, I recommend that you look at two specific aspects of that. The first would be that administrator's handling of protected health information. So they will be receiving claims information from participants for reimbursement. You want to be sure that that administrator is uh, following proper HIPAA procedures with the handling of that PHI and that they have measures in place to prevent disclosure of PHI. And you'll also want to evaluate the reasonableness of the fees being charged as compared to the services that you receive. And this is particularly important where the uh, cost of the administration is being passed through to participants. And finally, check in on your payroll and perhaps your HRIS vendor. So when it comes to your payroll vendor, uh, be sure that premium contributions are being deducted properly from uh, participant paychecks or from employee paychecks, uh, that the correct amounts are being deducted and there's not too little or too much being deducted. And then when it comes to your HRIS vendor, this is going to be a big area of compliance weakness that uh, I'm anticipating, and that's because a lot of employers are now going to be relying upon HRIS vendors to do things related to ACA compliance. So that could be tracking the eligibility uh, of your employees and participants, and then also um, perhaps so far as completing the ACA reporting requirements that will be coming due starting in 2016. So you want to make sure that you're not relying on faulty information or data. So do some random audits of that information that you're getting and make sure that it's accurate and that it, it, that it rises to the level that it needs to. So, you know, now that we've gone through the different steps of an, of an assessment, really how frequently should you be conducting an analysis? And this should be occurring at regular intervals, um, ideally two to four years. Every two to four years you should be doing this. Um, I think a more manageable approach is to take one or two pieces of the assessment each year and tackle those. Uh, but again, whatever works best for you, and you know, I think it's it, it's really manageable to just take one or two and do them um, every single year as opposed to doing a full-blown assessment um, every two to four years. But your main objective is to not let, uh, you know, three or four years go by without ever having checked in on these issues. Aside from regular intervals, there are also certain trigger events that will occur that will um, prompt you 
to undergo an assessment. And those are uh, frequent employer participant complaints. If your business undergoes a reorganization in the form of an acquisition or perhaps a merger with an already existing entity, you'll want to conduct some due diligence and uh, go through an assessment then. If you experience a significant change in third-party administrators or service providers, particularly if the reason for that change is because uh, of a failure or some sort of incompetency on their part, you'll want to do uh, some level of an assessment if you become aware of issues with the claims administration and adjudication process. And then perhaps the biggest red flag is if there's a pending lawsuit or formal inquiry. If you know that there's some complaint that a participant or employee is uh, going to be filing against you or the plan, that's a really great time to make sure that you have all your ducks in a row when it comes to compliance. You'll want to go through and touch on all of these areas because I assure you they will all come to light in that process. So as we can see, an assessment does require a substantial commitment of time and resources, depending upon how you choose to tackle that. Um, but you know the benefits are really very well worth it, and those come in several different forms. So um, the first is really preparedness. You'll be more prepared for agency audits and investigations by the DOL or IRS, as well as any potential participant or employee complaint. A gap assessment can result in a significant risk reduction, so you'll be able to correct compliance issues voluntarily and take that preemptive action. A gap assessment can result in a more efficient administration, particularly around the record keeping systems that you have in place in your organizational processes. So it should result in more efficient day-to-day -day administration. And then the most tangible uh, benefit really comes in the form of cost control. Um, so when you are evaluating your third-party costs and services, you'll have the opportunity to, to perhaps make some changes when it comes to those costs that you're paying. And then when it comes to the administration according to the terms of the plan, you'll be able to ensure that only eligible participants are actually participating and incurring claims on your plan and that can result in some significant cost control. So as you can see, um, despite the, um, the commitment that is required when it comes to these assessments, it is well worth it in the form of these rewards, not to mention the fact that compliance really is an issue uh, for every plan sponsor and administrator. So if you have, uh, you know, if you want more resources, I'm sorry, the slides are kind of skipping around on me today. Um, EBSA, so that's the division of the Department of Labor that uh, exercises oversight of compliance with ERISA. Um, EBSA has some great self-compliance checklists and resources on their website. And then, of course, on our felice.com website, we have uh, several publications related to benefit plan compliance. So take a look at those, as well as the PDF link to the handout there, um, and I think you'll, you'll be well set to tackle these assessments on your own. All right, so we have, we went over by a few minutes, um, so if you want to stick around, we can get through some questions, hopefully, and I will take those now. So does the carrier send out the COBRA information? So carriers will oftentimes provide you with um, some continuation coverage information, some COBRA information in the evidence of coverage or certificate of coverage uh, policy that you get. And uh, you are you you will be sharing that with your participants, um, but you know the short answer is no. It's not the carrier's obligation or uh, requirement to communicate COBRA information to your participants. That falls on the employer. Um, COBRA is different than Cal COBRA, which is a state law. And when it comes to Cal COBRA, yes, that does fall on the carriers, and the carriers are required to send out that information. But federal COBRA is a requirement that falls on employers. The next question is, if our required notices are on the Felice website, uh, the benefits website, will that suffice? We do have employees sign an acknowledgement that they can find notices there. Okay, so yes, that will suffice so long as those employees have regular work-related computer access. So when it comes to that 
that class of employees or that group of employees who has that regular work-related computer access, um, utilizing something like an online site or a, an intranet is totally acceptable and it does suffice as, um, as, as a sufficient means of distribution of those notices. Um, but if you have any employees who don't have that work-related computer access, you still need to get that uh, express consent from them before you rely on a website like that. So the website is a great solution, but you still need to make sure that you're getting consent from employees who you are required to get that from. Uh, the next question, <clears throat> how effective are outside parties who conduct gap assessments? So. Uh, there are a lot of third parties or vendors out there who um, may solicit you or who you can turn to to conduct a gap assessment on your behalf. And that's a great solution for times when you have a special circumstance or one of those trigger events. So if you have, for example, a business reorganization and you need to go through all this due diligence, yes, it's great to bring in the third party, um, you know, Generally, that's going to be a team of attorneys who will come in and handle that due diligence for you. But on a regular basis, on that two to four, you know, regular intervals that you should be doing these assessments, it really should fall on you to do that. And that's because, you know, number one, no one knows your plan and your administrative procedures better than you do. And the second reason is, again, it's your responsibility uh, to make sure that your plan is in compliance, and it's great to have these third parties and vendors step in and help you out with that, but you need to be able um, to know where your plan falls in this compliance spectrum. So it's important that you tackle it on a regular basis as well. <clears throat> um, let's see. Does the Cal does the Cal Cobra law fulfill the federal Cobra requirements? So. Uh, no, federal COBRA applies to employers with 20 or more uh, employees, and um, that's an entirely separate requirement than Cal COBRA. It's federal, and it requires things like that initial notice and then certain election notices be sent out. Um, so that's a separate requirement. Cal COBRA is a state law specific to California, and that one applies to employers uh, that have fewer than 20 employees, so for employers who are exempt from federal COBRA, and then it can also apply um, to employers that have federal COBRA, but as kind of an extension to that COBRA, um, to federal COBRA. But it's important to keep in mind, again, that there really aren't very many um, requirements, such as required notices, uh, that an employer must um, comply with when it comes to Cal Cobra. You're really going to be looking at federal Cobra law when it comes to figuring out what your obligations are as an employer. The two are very separate, um, and while they can work in tandem, you know, satisfying one does not, you know, result in compliance with the other. So they are separate. <clears throat> okay, I. I think that's it for the questions. If I happen to miss yours or if uh, a question comes up later on, um, please feel free to reach out to me via email. I love talking about compliance. I love talking about ERISA compliance. So um, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate uh, to reach out to me. And then again, be sure that you do download that PDF attachment. It goes into much greater detail than we were able to get into this morning. And I think you'll find it really helpful uh, when you start to um, tackle your own uh, ERISA assessment. So thank you very much for joining me this morning, and I hope you found it helpful.